How's it going? Good. All right, here we go. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, I'm too. Good. We're gonna rock it. Let's, After you. Let's head on in. And so we have all of our seating set up. So what I was gonna do is have us um, obviously up front here. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and like welcome everyone, tell them a little bit about this. Not everyone knows Jim and I. And also like the story about how we met in Pagosa and how we've just always loved your work. And we're just super excited to have you and representing you here in Dallas. And a little bit about the gallery, the new gallery space that'll be opening. And we're going to have you be a solo show for that opening. And then I thought I would just like ask you questions like, you know, the fun stuff, like where were you born and kind of what has inspired your work? You know, the usual kind of stuff. And then we can just ad lib it. You know what I mean? Kind yeah. of go back and forth. Talk about like the process, like between the collage and then the kind of like what you were talking about yesterday. So well, how you do the collage, but then how you do where you put the paper and then paint it kind of a thing. Because people ask me that. Quite a few people have asked me that. Like, what's the difference? Like, what's the difference in the process and stuff? Right, right. Yeah. And then it's also so cool, like the small ones, like where you got your papers and, you know, things like that. How you collect papers, like in your travels. And then I'm thinking like... I mean, is there anything else? I mean, other than we can just kind of wing it. Wing it. I'm that's, all about winging it because I love just having a conversation. Because if we get into a really good conversation, yeah. stuff will start coming out that I didn't say. And two you're days so ago. good. And you're so good at that. I'm just gonna let you. You know, I'm gonna just open it up and I'm gonna hand the microphone to you and then I'll just ask a few questions. But I am gonna give them a history of um, a lot what we have written on the website too about how you know you've got pieces in the museum and. The Tate, and um, you're in major collections all over the world, and you're represented all over the world. And, and then I'm going to hand you the microphone and just ask you fun stuff. How's that? Okay. Okay. Sounds Does good. Does that sound good? Yeah. Well, and I'm really jazzed about being in you guys' gallery. Yeah. We're so happy to have about you. About the show coming up in April. I'm really happy about that. I'll bring some much larger pieces. And of course, yeah, we've been buddies for at least a decade at this yeah. point. We figured that out last night, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we figured that out when we were talking last night. Yeah. And uh, since about 2011, I guess. Mm-hmm, yeah. And in Pagosa Springs uh, with with Jim's studio up there. I don't mm -hmm. think I ever went to your studio up there, but. I was working out of my home. Right. Yeah. I don't know if you, you guys probably never, I don't think I don't you guys think we came ever over. We were over, over at there. your house, right, yeah, right. for dinners. Yeah, yeah. And niece's graduation party. And yeah, because Rosalia was the one who's the cook. Yes. Among the bunch of us. And I'm not. <laughs> so I was always happy to be invited yeah, over. Right, yeah, right. So, Yeah. So it's great. Yeah, so it's going to be great. And uh, let's get on with it. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Cool. There's James Ferrari. So we're the, hey, James. We're the uh, principals and curators of Ferrari Gallery, which some of you guys know and some of you might not know that. So we welcome you today and Cecil um, I need to tell people like right, James and I met Cecil like about was an art she was an art critic right she's an art writer yeah yeah so we just happened to meet them because they were getting work done on their car and Jim's studio was on the other side and that is how it all started so you know we've known Cecil and his kids and it's Rosalie I mean for 12 years now so we are so Excited! We've been wooing T Cecil to um, come to the gallery, and uh, for quite some time. And so we are very excited. We love Cecil. We love his work. So we're really proud and honored to to have your work. You really are. And I'm proud, and, proud and honored to be here oh, with you guys. Thanks, thanks. And some of you may know. Yeah, we could close that. We have been renovating for almost. <laughs> quite a quite a bit of time now a new space for Ferrari gallery so we'll be moving there um, the physical move will be in January and then hopefully we're planning on opening in April so April is arts month in Dallas and Cecil will be opening the gallery for us with a solo show there so so for those of you who don't know Cecil and we have some people from SMU here by the way um, he is very widely recognized throughout the world and his work, I'm going to read this, appears in collections of several major museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Chicago Art Institute, and the Tate Modern in London. 
and his works are found in many, many places all around the world. And he's also played a major role in the fine arts arena for over, I want to say for over two decades, but maybe right? three. Maybe three. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and his work is shown, I mean, you're shown all over the world. So, but you are also the founder and the director of the International Museum of Collage Assemblage and Construction and the co founder of the International Post Dogmatist Group. Dogmatist. So, dogmatist, sorry. Forgive me for that. So, the International Post Dogmatist Group. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we are happy to have you here and let's get this started, right? Let's find out a little bit about Cecil. Um, I'm gonna okay, but, but I'm going to start with a little caveat here. So you mentioned those big museums mm -hmm. and I do have something in those collections, but it's usually something that is from a Fluxus project because I been involved with the, the Fluxus, contemporary Fluxus gang for 20 or so years. And, and so we're always doing projects and then these different collections, you know, like the MoMA or whoever, mm -hmm. uh, picks up, um, you know, one, one version of those projects a lot of the time. So I know one of the, my friends in St. Louis had gotten all of these archivists to accept uh, this whole rash of uh, what's called assemblings, which are where all the artists send the main guy uh, a piece of art of some sort um, to go in an envelope. And then let's say a dozen artists send something, they send like 40, and then each artist then gets back one of everybody's stuff and then that leaves the publisher with, you know, 15 or 20 uh, versions uh, to then sell off or to donate to other archives. So a lot of my stuff is in a lot of these big collections through little weird bits of stuff that I sent with all of these <laughs> projects. However, one of them is the Contemporary Art Museum in Chicago, where we all met together for a Fluxus exhibition, and about 40 or 50 of us showed up to do a, like two days of uh, Fluxus events at the museum. So I come in and I'm looking at the exhibit that they have set up, and you know, there's all the big you know, the, the Fluxus guys used to say 12 big names, <laughs> you know, like as part of their way that they would project, uh, you know, that they're important, you know, it's, uh, you know, for some exhibition or whatever. I got so. My <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so he's got his headphones on, so yeah. he doesn't even know he's talking. <laughs> so anyway. I'm looking at these and, and so all of the original heavy hitter Fluxus guys are in this vitrine and I'm looking at the work and I'm, I think, oh, that's really nice. And there, then there's two or three of mine in the same case. So I'm being regarded as, you know, an equal among, among the gang, even though I'm like many years later. And uh, the head curator comes up to me and says, oh, you're Cecil Tush? And I say, yeah. And she says, well, I've got a story for you. I said, okay, let's hear it. So she said, we were setting up this vitrine and we got it all put together. And, and I'm going through the inventory list. And she goes, where's the other Tushan? I don't see it, where is it? So the whole staff from the museum you know, that's working on the show, they all get together and they're looking around trying to figure out where's the Cecil Tushan? Where's the Cecil Tushan? And um, so they dump out the trash can to see if maybe somehow it got thrown away. Oh my gosh. And sure enough, uh, in the trash can was the piece. But the reason it got thrown away was it was a piece called Tear Test that was stamped Tear Test Number Two. And, and, a, and a stamp that said Fluxus Laboratories, uh, you know, tested. And then another stamp that said International post Dogmatist Group approved. And then I just put my, you know, initials and the year on it. 
but it was just a piece of brown packing paper that had been torn oh. and, and and so it, because it was a piece called tear test so I was just tearing paper and I, until I had about 50 pieces and then I was putting all the stamps on them and then they all as a group became a part of some of these assemblings you know for somebody's project so so the lady said oh we were like freaking out and she said we finally found it and she pointed to the one it was and I, I said yeah I can see how that might end up in the trash and nobody would notice <laughs> so we had a big laugh over that but it taught me a lesson that for a museum they could have just as easily lost a Picasso and been just as frustrated as over this little bit of trash paper with some stamps on it and mm -hmm. my signature. So, you know, that kind of tells you that for collections, everything is of equal importance and nothing's supposed to be missing and everybody's supposed to know where exactly everything is because mm -hmm. it's a collection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing exactly. can go missing. Yeah. It has to be hermetically sealed. Mm -hmm. So if I, so then, you know, later I said, well, I know I ended up with something in that collection, that collection at the MoMA, wherever. So I said, am I supposed to say I'm in that collection? Because it's not something you're going to see hanging on the wall anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'm in the collection. And I can see how a curator considers everything important. So, yeah, oh, I'm going to add it to my resume as part of the. <laughs> yeah. Now, what part of the MoMA I'm in, I have no idea. As far as I know, it's you know down in the in a dark room someplace. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that until someday, 20 years from now, when they're putting those shows together from the early 20th century, mm -hmm. then they're going to go, "Is this a Cecil Tushan? I don't know. It doesn't have his name on it. it just has CT initials, or it just has Fluxus Laboratories on it. You know. <laughs> so what? who knows? Can you explain the Fluxus? Well, Fluxus, I mean, which is, you know, I, as a, as a post-dogmatist, I'll start there. The International Post-Dogmatist Group was started by three painters in the painting department of the University of Texas at Arlington um, on the third Thursday in March at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in 1987 that's our that's our start okay. moment so pretty soon within a couple of weeks the entire art department of uta all became post dogmatists and so we all became this big gang the, the whole bunch so ever since then i don't know how much everybody else has pursued it but i've pursued post dogmatism ever since and and we occasionally get together like we just did the other night. We all had, you know, at least five of us got together and had dinner. But we usually don't have that many of us show up in one place because everyone, we consider everybody a post dogmatist. You just don't know it yet. Yeah. <laughs> and so part of the whole post dogmatist thing at the beginning was the idea that artists, if they remain individuals, then they get picked off by institutions. You know, the institutions are telling all the artists what, what they're going to consider important, what they're not going to consider important. And then all the curators at the institutions come up with their own ideas, and then they just pick artists out of the, you know, from the native, <laughs> uh, you know, bunch of artists that are out there working to illustrate their theory that they just came up with as an example. I noticed that a lot in the 80s and 90s. So we decided as a group, we're still not going to actually be a group. We're going to be a bunch of individual artists, but we're going to create this facade of an institution. So we came up with our own museum, number one. But the other thing was we're all supposed to interact with each other as a persona, which is an office, a bureau, an institution. So, you know, so we're, we're institutionally interacting with each other at, from the desk of this president to the desk of that secretary, to this bureau, to this investigation group, to whatever. And just to create this, this paper trail of institutionalism 
as a bunch of artists to be in competition with the the larger you know institutional yeah. groups like museums and curator groups and that sort of thing okay so it was a sort of a fun political challenge to terrorize <laughs> the bureaucracy <laughs> you know back at that time um, with all our own institutional power mm -hmm. and that every every post dogmatist had the power of the whole post dogmatist group and institutions that it represents behind them that they could speak as if they're speaking from this entire group of institutional power. Okay. Which is a funny idea. Okay. So one of my things then coming to the question was to then as the international post dogmatist group usurp other groups and and bring the, you know, notify them that they had become a subsidiary of the international post dogmatist group <laughs> so the fluxus gang was one of those groups where you are now you have the honor of being a subsidiary of the international post dogmatist group and put our umbrella over everybody <laughs> okay. just as part of our joking around yeah. so that's how i got involved with all those guys but then I, I actually started participating because there was an email group back in those days that you know was some of the original Fluxus members, but also all of the other younger generation Fluxus artists that you know are totally into it. And then, but nobody knew: Are we still Fluxus artists, even though we're not part of that original group? And you know, then the Silvermans amass this massive collection of uh, original Fluxus art up till 1987, which was when George Machunis died, which was the founder. So they decided that's the end of Fluxus when that guy died. But I started positing, no, this is a oral tradition, just like any other oral tradition like Zen, mm -hmm. and it's gonna go forward and keep growing uh, without any original members. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I've been pushing. But they donated their entire collection as a way of canonizing Fluxus. Okay, right? that's right. Uh, they donated the entire collection to the MoMA, which now has its own Fluxus room at the, at the MoMA. And they, so they have this massive collection of, of the first generation Fluxus artists. But That's they all cool. want to leave all the rest of us out because that gets too sloppy. What do you mean too sloppy? It gets too sloppy to collect because it doesn't have any certain value because it's just, you know, it's like a, a, a live wire that, you know, is out okay. there doing its own thing and they, nobody can collect it because even Fluxus itself was originally intended to be non-collectible. Mm -hmm. They thought it was at the time. And uh, so that it was originally a political movement like that, but it was always intended to be ongoing indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So the collectors are the ones trying to put the cap in the bottle. And so it just becomes an interesting ongoing uh, power play, you know, between the arts community itself and then the collecting community with the institutions in between mm -hmm. um, trying to create the buffer okay. between the money and the creators. Okay. That's how I see it. So anyway, so that's pretty much the story on Fluxus. So Fluxus also developed an international mail art community, which is artists who mail artworks back and forth to each other all over the world. So there's this network of two, three, five thousand artists all over the world that are constantly interacting with each other through the mail, sending art back and forth. And there's large archives being built. Uh, one especially is called, uh, there's one in Hungary called uh, Art, it's got, it's like Art Spike or something like that, that's not the name of it, but Anyway, th that guy's been working on that collection for years and finally got the institutional backing of the government to have a real archive that's funded. Oh, wow, that's great. For mail art. That's and really cool. uh, uh, yeah, so that's interesting. So I'm involved in that community. 
which also the Fluxus guys, but then I'm also involved in avant-garde poetry groups, concrete poetry, that kind of thing. And originally, when I started making this type of work, I introduced it in the uh, concrete and visual poetry groups that was pretty much all the heavy hitters that were willing to interact with each other. Uh, and they started looking at me like, what? It doesn't even say anything. I say, yeah, but it's visual and it's poetic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you guys uh, that are poets trying to make visual stuff, you know, you're stuck on words. Mm -hmm. You know, we're artists, we're stuck on images. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to understand that it, it's not always going to go there. And, and those guys accepted that. And I've ended up in a number of uh, you know, international anthologies on, uh, you know, concrete poetry and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Also some ones for collage and one recently came out that was about collage that was out of Spain. I was in that one mm -hmm. recently. So, you know, so a, a lot of my work is about archiving, thinking about artists from all over the world in these these very specific communities that interest me collage asymic writing um, which the, you know when I started showing a lot of these pieces as asymic writing some of the asymic writer guys go there's no writing in it I say yeah but it's it's exactly the same process tear it, you know reduce the thing down to abstraction it's language there you go asymic yeah. Might not be writing, but it's asemic. <laughs> yeah, and that's this is probably a good uh, segue into like how you create your pieces because of topography and the paper and you you know what I'm saying, and the found papers. We've got some of the small pieces which it's really fascinating to hear about. Like, oh yeah, over found. the corner over there. Yeah. So and then I always get the question too, like what's the difference between the collage pieces and then the painted pieces? So Right. So uh, we can take these three behind me as an example that these all originally, okay, these three, that black one, square one back there. Joel's favorite. <laughs> specifically those. Th this one's a little different, but with these that I just pointed out, that's a specific font from a poster that I made in 2005 based on a poster that I brought back from Paris, a protest poster in 2002 when I was in Paris for May Day. It was May Day mm -hmm. in Paris, you know, protests all over the place, whatever. And But then it started raining about four o'clock and everybody started going home and then all the sanitation crews all over Paris go out the next hour and completely clean all the streets in Paris. It's, it's wow. kind of mind blowing. Yeah, they don't do that here. Two, uh, two, hour, <laughs> two hours later, you could never tell anybody was even there. Wow. And I mean, it was just covered with paper and trash and That's a good city. posters and yeah. whatever. But I mean, they were just basically there, you know, cleaning up this. So, which I thought was fascinating, but. I was walking around before they got to the area where I was standing at, and I found a, a couple of these little posters about this big that uh, said, Stop the Violence. That was on the poster for mm -hmm. probably, I guess, the Iraq War going on or who knows what. And uh, at that time, 2002, yeah, it would have been right, right when the war's yeah. getting started, right? Yeah. Somewhere around there. So. Uh, so I picked those up and I thought those are interesting. So I put them in my suitcase, I brought them home with me. I made two or three collages from those posters that had been rained on and walked all over and they were all torn up and messed up, holes in them and so forth. But I chopped, brought them home, dried them out, chopped them up, made a couple of nice little collages, sent them to my dealer in New York City and uh, she immediately sold them the same week that I shipped them to her and she, and she called me up and she says, I'm going to need some more like that. <laughs> You're like, ooh, I better. Ooh, that was found material and that's all I had. <laughs> hmm, what am I going to do about that? So sometime in there, I, we were another group that 
the International Post Office Group subsumed was uh, the Mass Surrealist Group, which I don't, you may or may not have ever heard of Mass Surrealism, but that's a rising star right now in the digital world, Mass Surrealism. So I contacted the guy who started that back in 92 or 93 and told him, uh, we have determined that your group is worthy to be with, under the umbrella of the International Post Office Group, which of course no other art group wants to ever hear somebody else say, you're a part of our group now. <laughs> what? Nobody yeah. does that. But this was, you know, just a fun, just funny mm -hmm. idea. So this guy who is named James C. Haper uh, is a little bit, uh, you know, he's always a little bit paranoid all the time, just as an individual. Where does he live? Uh, right now, he's living up like in Minneapolis or someplace, but he travels all over the world. I think mm -hmm. next month he's moving for an indefinite period of time to Poland in a little cabin in a little town 60 miles from Ukraine. Somebody wow. he knows offered him to use their place mm -hmm. while, while they're here in the States. So he's thinking about doing that. Anyway, he's been all over the place, Germany. Uh, he's German in general, but um, uh, he's owned properties in Argentina, in Spain, and okay. in the you know so forth. So he just uh, likes to roam around for whatever reason. But he's continuously pushing mass surrealism and pushing the book of mass surrealism, which I'm in. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we we sub subsumed him. And so that got our conversation started between, him and I became good friends, and I just talked to him probably last week. And uh, anyway, what, why was I bringing up? So your uh, dealer in New York was like, Oh yeah, dealer in New York. Like <laughs> right, that's exactly why. So we were gonna, James and I were arranging to do possibly a mass surrealist art festival in Berlin. Mm -hmm. in 2005. So I thought, you know, I need some paper like those kind of those ones from, from Paris. <laughs> from Paris. So I, I, I designed a poster that said Mass Surrealism, you know, Berlin 2005. Um, and, uh, but I designed it in a way that I made all the letters the sizes that I wanted them to be for these collages. Okay. So I had it printed out in a, an edition of 500 uh, that I still have at least three or 400. <laughs> <laughs> but every time I'm ready to make some more of this kind of collage, then, uh, then there, these are like six by nine inch collages originally. And then they're made into these paintings, you know, using them as studies. But then also we took over the, uh, Neoist Society, which is a different group of kind of wacko guys from like the late 80s or early 90s. So I made the uh, the translingual Neoist Manifesto, which was all made out of the, Im the collages from this set okay. of collages that I made into a book. And they, they have in Neoism, there's two main two there's three or four, but there's two main ones named Karen Elliott and uh, Monty Kansen. And so you can find a lot of Karen Elliott and Monty Kansen stuff that's written. And, and those guys are considered just uh, composite characters that anybody can claim to be Monty Kansen or Karen Elliott and write as if they are to, to build up this persona for each of those two characters. They're like pop oh star goodness. characters, okay. pop up characters. So any neoist can just start writing about as if they are Karen Elliott and whatever, or Monty Kansen. So I looked up a bunch of the stuff that though they had written, you know, as Monty Kansen, Karen Elliott, and so for my book of these images for the translingual edition of the Neoist Manifesto, 
one page was the collages and the other half of the page was commentary from Karen Elliott and Monty Canson that supposedly had something to do with the collage next to it <laughs> as <Okay>. commentary. Okay. <laughs> so, which is totally funny, hilarious idea too. I mean, you can tell I'm kind of into humor, art humor. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so some of those guys started seeing this translingual edition of, of the Neoist Manifesto, of which I'm not even sure there ever was a Neoist Manifesto, but they started wondering, who the hell is this guy right, writing the Neoist Manifesto? And, and one guy that was the biggest, uh, was a guy out of England, uh, Stuart Holmes, that was the main known character for writing Neoist documents. Mm -hmm. He got a hold of me and was wondering, who the hell am I? Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, that was funny. But, you know, it's just part of my post dogmatist thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm just saying that as I went from the Paris couple of papers to making the mass surrealist mm -hmm. uh, poster mm -hmm. to making the neoist <laughs> manifesto, all of that's kept me quite busy and entertained over many years of time. And then I just keep making paintings based on all this crazy stuff I'm dreaming up all the time. In the case of Joel's favorite piece over here, uh, once I realized, oh, I could just print my own printed matter. I don't have to find it. Mm -hmm. I can just print it myself. So I, I got a large format printer and I thought, what if I make my own lettering, but I just digitally write the letters in different colors over the top of each other. Yeah. Instead of, you know, having only the letter and the negative space, what, what, what if the letters are being written on top of each other and then print that paper out and then chop it up and end up with these collages that give me a much wider range of color possibilities right. and, 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 you can and do space. Size, right? Huh? And then you could do them any size. Do them any size once it becomes a painting. Uh, a lot of the earliest Fluxus guys took John Cage's courses at the you know New York University or wherever he was teaching at the time. And they came up with this idea of instead of a musical score that they would do an event score that they would write a little score as an event. And then that score could then be performed over and over again by anybody. And then some of the scores were so poetic that you weren't even sure what it meant. Yeah. But yeah. Each, each Fluxus artist, like, like it just might say just red, green, mm -hmm. or something, <laughs> or start, stop. Uh, George Brecht was famous for these really kind of cryptic, wonderful, very simple scores. And so the event score became a big part of the whole Fluxus uh, mm -hmm. regime of how they did things. And so they always like to do performance pieces, you know, on That's stage cool. or whatever. And they just go through the book of everybody's scores and they'd pick what all the performances were going to be for the evening. And uh, so in that sense, it's like, you know, a score for uh, uh, Yoko Ono was also a part of Fluxus. Uh, one of her scores was Box of Smile. That was the name of it. And, and what it was was uh, a, usually a round box that when you opened it, it had a round mirror in the bottom that you could see yourself. Uh -huh. It would make you smile. Uh, box of smile. Box of smiles. So when she okay. sold that, then she just made another one and then later another one. Mm -hmm. And she just kept making a new one every time she needed one because the piece was the idea, mm -hmm. box of smile. Mm -hmm. It could be any, <laughs> any, any iteration of that later, just like with the musical score, you can play Mozart for the next thousand years and play the same score and it'll be a new different performance, mm -hmm. but it'll all be the same score being played over and over again over the centuries. Wow. So 
I use that idea of the fluxus score that my collages are a score for the performance of a painting. Uh, so that also opens me up that I can make one painting from that score or I can make a bunch of paintings from that mm -hmm. score if I like it enough. Yeah. And I think, oh yeah, that's, that remains interesting to me. I think I'll make a bigger version or I'll make it a slightly different color or yeah. I'll do something else because I really like the composition a lot or whatever. So, you know, sometimes, and, and that's a, like a freak out in the painting arena of making more than one mm -hmm. of the same idea. Mm -hmm. You know, one painting that's the same as the next painting. But they're you different. know, it's like, what? Yeah. No, no, you can't do that. <laughs> All right, well, any, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so bear with me. Sure. Um, I'm a psychoanalyst. And you think I'm nuts. <laughs> um, actually, so I, I'm just thinking about the theory of psychoanalysis and the, the idea is like building up words and that is maturational and progressive and the break, you're breaking down words and I, I like your idea of like creating a more muted silence. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could speak to like regression versus progressive communication in your work because an analyst might say like breaking down words is regressive but your work doesn't seem like that at all. So I just thought you could talk about like the progressive nature of your breakdown of words. Of, of what that means to me or whatever? I don't, however you free associate. Well, <laughs> okay. I could go kind of deep on that idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a really, that's an interesting okay. question. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and say it. I had this massive mystical experience when I was 21 where I fell into the infinite. And at the time I said, I fell into a place where words cannot follow. There's no words for oh, that place. Okay. Okay, being stretched out across the infinite, seeing the beginnings of time, seeing the conclusion of time, seeing all that. When you were 21. When I was 21. Wow. Well, I was, I was actually thinking about a machine, because I was in college at the time, I was thinking of this little machine I wanted to build as a sculptural object, which was two mirrors facing each other on this little little this little apparatus you know like, kind of like a, a scale mm -hmm. but it was just two mirrors and that it had a a candle in the middle below center and then a, a little tiny hole drilled in one of them just above center so that you could look through the little hole and see how far back into the infinite you could look because it gets darker and darker and darker as you're looking, you know, mm. through those. So I was wondering, how far back can you see if you put a candle in, in there? For some reason, that question exploded my brain and I literally fell over backwards on the floor and you passed out? Did you I didn't pass out? pass out. You just I had there? all of a sudden I found myself all of a sudden there was this wheel that was a size unimaginable and on the side of it maybe call it the wheel of car and the dharma wheel maybe and on it was all of these little windows that went around like billions and billions and billions and billions wow. And one of the little doors had opened and I had fallen out of it and I was connected by a cord to that window and I thought, oh shit, I just fell out of there. <laughs> and then I'm looking around and then I start just having all of these different images. All of a sudden I see the, the beginning of time when light and dark are swirling, you know, kind of like a yin and yang thing. Yeah, starting wow. to separate themselves. That was one experience. Then later, I flew apart to infinitely large, infinitely small, infinitely in, infinitely out, 
infinitely all directions, all of me all at once being stretched out in all those directions. Then somewhere in 15 or 20 minutes later, in, in real time, uh, then all of a sudden I, I was experiencing this like I was the center of a donut and that the entire universe was going like this through me like that. Wow. And that and that it was made out of all the strands of every being that was a, that ever lived, that was you know present in the universe, passing through me. Wow. And 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 the completion of everything. And that I was completely complete, mm -hmm. that there was nowhere to go from that point because I was. Whew, it. Wow. I was it. I was everything. In your eyes, were you you were. Just like a dream state? Was that no, no, I was wide awake. Wow. So, yeah. So, so I'm so I'm laying there and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I can't move out of this space because it's like total completion of the entire universe. So I thought, oh, my buddies that are in the same room with me, they're taught, they continue talking, they don't notice that I'm having any kind of crazy experience, and. And I go, they're going to have to probably call an ambulance and have me take, I can't even move. Yeah. So after another minute or two of laying there experiencing that, just the total completion of the entire universe, then I just decided I'm going to try to move my fingers. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that if I could create sensation in my hands that I could anchor my consciousness back in my body and pull it back from all over the universe, hopefully. Wow, I've never heard of that ever happening. So, okay, so, right. okay, so we, okay, need so, hear, we need to hear her. Okay, so <laughs> I finally started to rub, rub my hands and, and I, I figured out how to sit up. I'm not kidding you, it was like I didn't even know how to sit up. Because I was like Your mind the universal expanding. being trying to wake up in a little tiny body thing, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I kind of rubbed my hands, and I was still totally scattered out to the four winds. And I, I told one of the guys, I said, I can't even explain to you what's happening right now. I mean, mm -hmm. it's still happening while I'm talking. And he said, you know what, you're going to need to go take off your clothes and get in the bathtub, run the water. So I say, yeah, because he was thinking that would help ground me. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh yeah, that might be a really good idea. So I kind of wandered into the bathroom. I took off my clothes. I run the water. The water is alive. I can see it alive. The water is living. I see the life in it. Have you guys heard, have the kids heard this? And uh, more, more or less. So then I sat down in the water and I realized what he told me to do was exactly right because I had to rebirth myself. Wow. <laughs> wow. So I, I then got dressed and I left, but I, I was still like completely not altogether here. And I rode home on a bus. I lived several miles away and I, I had to shelter my, myself from the spectacular beauty of everything and the sound in everybody's mind of what they're thinking. And, and that my mind would run off into the infinite if I saw a line of telephone poles. Wow. And so I finally made it back to my apartment and I turned off the lights, closed the drapes, and I stayed there for three days before I could recover wow. myself enough to go outside. <laughs> wow. And then it took me more than a year to recover from that. Oh my goodness. It was pretty crazy. And then, you know, and like I'm listening, I'm, you know, uh -huh. so I started talking to the universe and I said, you know, it kind of scared me. I mean, mm -hmm. as you might guess, I said, oh, okay, all of that is the divine being mm -hmm. and we're inside of it and it's unescapable. There's nowhere you can go to hide from it. 
And I thought, oh, I hope it's not tyrannical. <laughs> So, wow. but, but then I looked that it was the totality of everything and I just started talking to it and I said, you're so alone in your unity that there's only you here and you know it. There's nothing else here. There is nothing. This is manifestation, I tell my kids sometimes, the manifest world that we live in and experience as individuals is that being taking a vacation from its loneliness. Wow, to, to okay, ex- this is deep. <laughs> to experience itself as many. Wow. <laughs> so, so that did... led to progression. Progression. So what these painting represent is being in a place where language is meaningless, okay. where everything we ever think about means nothing whatsoever that whoever you think you are and what you're trying to shoot for gets completely annihilated in the end. And there's no way that you can get to that space unless it falls on your head like a building. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. You can try to prepare for it, but you have no idea what it is and you can't imagine it, but it's exactly all of us and we're all it. And some days, I guess, it wakes up somewhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it woke up in me for that, that 15 or 20 minute period of time. And I've been adjusting myself ever since. Yeah, so it inspired, but it inspired your... So it inspired this idea of, of the breaking down of language into the unknowable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but showing the beauty of the great harmony of everything. Yeah, yeah. That wow. that we get lost in in yeah. language, thinking that it means something when it means zip it means nothing whatsoever. I mean, what, what, confront con, when you confront that infinite reality. Well, I'll just say that. Yeah, that was beautiful. By the way, um, thank you for sharing that. And for me to look at the work for the first time because I actually stumbled in <laughs> by, by kismet chance. Um, it, it kind of reminds so before I was an analyst, I was a dancer. So um, for me, it was sort of pulling me into like the early cave paintings um, that you would see like when, you know, early humans were just starting to write. And right like shapes. pull out like concepts in movements and that's you know, not necessarily like talking, but it's still communicating, but within another realm. Um, Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, a lot, yeah, I I think what I'm trying to say is I'm communicating with the primitive singularity, you know, (laughs) that I know I'm not trying to talk to you or me or whoever, because we're all just the one thing taking a vacation (laughs) in in, in multiplicity. And and we're, we're all, you know, having fun, and that, that's why we should, you know, I mean, and if you have that idea, you can go look at the scriptures from anywhere in the world, and they all point to exactly that same thing. The golden rule is all about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Treat others yeah. as yourself because they are. Yeah. Do you want to others as, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, so if you want to, if you want to pull in a bunch of negative shit, you know, just be angry and mean to everybody. Right. And that's true. And if you want positive energy, right? So, yeah, you know, but, but any, everything really almost kind of doesn't matter because all of our experiences, good, evil, whatever, Mm -hmm. everybody is one little tiny bit of the whole thing having an experience. And it doesn't really matter what the experience is. It just wants to experience through us. We're, we're instruments wow. for its own self-discovery. Yeah, it seems like that's not a satire, but okay. like, off the, like primary versus secondary process. Like what's on the surface versus what's really down. Down in the depth, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, you know, if if you can accept that idea that, we're just all the one being on vacation, you know, briefly. Yeah. Having fun. You might as well just have fun. 
Might yeah. as well make art. I mean, wait for it to talk to you. It's always omniscient within us at, the, at our deepest mm -hmm. core. And mm -hmm. if we just go inside far enough, we're gonna fall right into that, mm -hmm. in, into the divine being. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't get away from it. You might as well love it. You might as well try to find your, and, and so I think, you know, most human beings all over the world, one way or another, they're always trying to understand the great divine movement of harmony that keeps everything exactly flowing. And, every, and it loves everything because everything is only itself having an expression of some kind. But we're all just wisps of divine imagination. Yeah, I mean, so artists I think, can... I think the way I understand that is that artists channel that creativity mm -hmm. from somewhere. A lot, mm -hmm. I, think, I think a lot of artists and creative people in general, dancers, mm -hmm. uh, actors, uh, musicians. Yeah, musicians, right. I mean, even they, writers. Where did it come from? It's not yeah. happening. I'm just kind of... I'm just kind of the person doing the Channel. work. Like yeah, else that's happening. true. The deeper you get into your creativity, the more you're not there anymore. That's so true. <laughs> that's so true. Because it's like, where did this come from? And if you want to accept that, and that's what helps you create art. We have got artists here. You know, it's you know. It or what from. blocks you is yeah. your ego. Yeah. You know? Yes. Your yeah. your smallness. Yeah. Like what I like to say is that the childlike nature. Yeah. Yeah. Because exactly. When you get out of the way. Yes, mm -hmm. that's when the creativity flows. And you guys, I mean, I mean, these guys are young artists as well. So, I mean, you're right. It's any kind of creative field that's... Well, that's, that's, why, that's why the singular being is called the creator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, art, big artist number one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've heard other people talk about that experience. Like the woman that wrote Eat, Pray, Love. That's what she said. She goes... She had an experience like that? She did. She said when she wrote that book over a couple of years, she said it, that, that it was with her. And it's what gave her the idea to write that book. And she totally tapped into that. And she said that's what allowed her to be the writer that she is. Yeah, and I think all of us, I mean, that's actually, we don't realize it, but mm -hmm. that's the, the one connector we're all looking for that makes everything else right. make sense. Right. You know, and it's all just right there in the depth of your own being, and, and you're totally surrounded by it at all times, and you can't escape it. Yeah. So you might as well love life. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> you're right, right here in the middle of it. Exactly. And it's just to enjoy it. Exactly. Yeah. And to help each other and to be, be that. good to one another. Right. And, yeah. Right. Yay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Wait, we really whoo, took a dive. That was good, though. That was great. Thanks, Cecil. Yay. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean